Welcome to the Kings and Queens podcast with your host, Johnny Langton. Before the episode, I want to clear up some potential confusion. In the Middle Ages, Matilda was an extremely common name. There's two women in Stephen's life who have the same name. I will refer to those women by their titles to avoid the confusion. The daughter of Henry I will be referred to as Empress Matilda, and the wife of Stephen will be referred to as Matilda of Boulogne. Thank you. Upon sieging a castle in 1153, the royal army held a five-year-old hostage. It was time to return the child to the castle. In a manner of retribution for the breaking of a truce, the five-year-old would be returned by catapult. Just before the launch, it was halted with furious protest by none other than the king himself, Stephen, who then led the boy to his tent to play conquers. Stephen was good-looking, popular, chivalrous, and charming to everyone, regardless of stature. It meant his route to the throne was straightforward. However, his reign was utterly dominated by his failure to consolidate. The War of Anarchy between the cousins, the crowned King Stephen, and Henry I's daughter, Empress Matilda, was enabled by their own inadequacies in leadership, in sharp contrast to their predecessors, Henry I, and their grandfather, William the Conqueror. This violent stalemate, which plagued England for nearly two decades, led a country once rich and overflowing with luxuries into one that was wretched and desolate. This is Stephen. Stephen of Blois was born in around 1097. His father had gone with Robert Curtos to the Crusades and died there in 1102. His mother was Adela of Normandy, the daughter and sister to the three previous kings of England. At just 10 years old, Henry sent for Stephen to be in his court in England. He quickly became a favourite and was popular among his peers and superiors. Through years of trust, he was given vast land and wealth. He married Matilda of Boulogne, granddaughter of Malcolm III, King of Scotland, who was the brother of Henry I's wife. Stephen brimmed with royal blood. Matilda of Boulogne's worth was not limited to her lineage. She was a formidable ally of Stephen and proved more able and more popular amongst her warriors. By the time his uncle Henry I died, the 40-year-old Stephen was among the most rich and powerful figures in England. So who would succeed Henry I? All the barons had sworn allegiance to Henry's chosen successor, his daughter, Empress Matilda, including Stephen, twice. However, it was Stephen who got to Winchester first to claim the crown. Most barons were quick to back the cousin. Medieval society viewed women as fallible, vulnerable, and in need of male counsel. But was this decision just down to sexism? No. While the barons found it difficult to accept a woman as a leader, there were other reasons why Stephen initially had the lion's share of support, and Empress Matilda didn't. Stephen was a likeable, wealthy, established figure in Anglo-Norman society. 
His brother Henry was Bishop of Winchester, who gained the support of the church. While Stephen was brought to court as a child, Matilda was whisked away to the Holy Roman Empire as its empress at just eight years old. In a society which placed more emphasis on queen consorts, she quickly became a strong-willed, resolute and influential figure in German society. Due to her time abroad, she was not well known in England. This imperious, divisive, almost alien empress was now thrusted upon the unsettled barons as Henry's successor. She then married Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, the bitter enemy of Normandy, and therefore England. Not only that, in the months before Henry's death, Empress Matilda and Geoffrey had been in direct revolt against the king. Whispers of Henry's deathbed regret and absolution for the Baron's oath to his daughter's succession were willfully and enthusiastically accepted as the truth. It was clear Stephen was the straightforward, familiar choice. To crown Empress Matilda was to flirt with the unknown. Finally, with medieval succession, friends, wealth and royal blood are useful implements for power, but also luck. With Empress Matilda far away, embattled and pregnant, Stephen got to England first and was crowned just three weeks after the death of Henry, on the 22nd of December, 1135, in Westminster Abbey. Stephen was king. The barons at Stephen's court soon found out that his congeniality by no means matched his ability to govern when Stephen's friends became his subordinates. The intricate mediation of Henry I between warring factions could not be replicated by Stephen. It is a credit to Henry just how quickly it unravelled when barons were not kept in check. Stephen made several immediate errors of judgment. He lavishly spent the treasures of his predecessor and committed the cardinal sin of kingship when he disregarded seniority by favouring certain barons over others, immediately alienating valuable counsellors. He sacked prominent administrators, including Roger of Salisbury, whom Henry had empowered to centralise royal power and command the shires, he replaced these men with inexperienced military men. He then mistreated bishops by expropriating their lands and he disregarded his own brother, Henry, Bishop of Winchester, even after his help by refusing him the vacant position of Archbishop of Canterbury. The slowly deteriorating political situation saw rivals abroad take advantage. David, King of Scotland, invaded England in 1138, taking Cumberland, Northumbria, Durham and Lancaster. The Welsh reclaimed castles in Carmarthen and Clanstephon, and perhaps most concerning was the invasion of Normandy by Geoffrey of Anjou. While it would take years for Normandy to fall, Stephen had immediately lost control 
of England's prized overseas territory. His treatment of lords is even more unwise when you consider he had a strong claimant for his crown. The result of the early chaos meant eager defectors to Empress Matilda. Henry, Stephen's brother, ran off of Chester, who had lost land to the Scots, and perhaps crucially, the illegitimate son and key advisor of Henry I, brother of Empress Matilda, the most influential baron of them all, Robert of Gloucester. The baronial schism was the catalyst for civil war. By 1139, four years after she had been disinherited by her cousin Stephen, the patient and ever watchful Empress was ready. She set sail for England. The Empress made straight for Arundel Castle under the protection of her stepmother, Adeliza of Levan. Stephen and his forces rapidly laid siege to the castle. The Empress was surrounded before she had laid a finger on her enemy. In an act of chivalry which would divide contemporaries and modern historians alike, instead of imprisoning or killing the Empress, King Stephen simply let her go. She made for Bristol Castle and began setting up an alternative government and awaiting her allies. The war had begun. Though brutal, this war would not predominantly consist of traditional pitched battles, but hard-fought, enduring castle sieges. However, in 1141 came the most significant battle in the war, when Ranulf of Chester attacked a loyal stronghold of the king, Lincoln, taking the castle. This attracted the forces of Stephen, who laid siege. However, Robert of Gloucester headed an army and marched. The two armies clashed. The royal forces were overwhelmed, but the affable Stephen was not so generous on the battlefield. Though the day was lost, he carried on. As described by contemporaries, he refused to sully his fame by the disgrace of flight. He fought like a lion, grinding his teeth and foaming at the mouth like a boar. The sword was not the king's first choice of weapon. Instead, he wielded a viking axe, marvelously striking down his enemies. When finally his axe was shattered, he was felled when a rock struck his helmet. The king was captured. His stronghold, Lincoln, was sacked as the citizens, driven to panic and despair, fled, some drowning in the river with them to escape the horror. The horror which would blight the country with increasing depravity and destruction. The beleaguered, defeated king would be imprisoned in Bristol Castle. It was all but over for Stephen. The victorious Empress Matilda headed to Westminster, flanked by powerful converted barons, to be crowned Queen of England. Yet, even with the support, the attempt to be crowned at Westminster collapsed in the face of bitter opposition from the London crowds, and also from Rome. While the jovial Stephen was comfortable with all classes of people, Empress Matilda, according to contemporaries, alienated the hearts of almost everyone with an insufferable arrogance. Along with the Londoners, Henry the Bishop of Winchester rejoined his brother's cause. Her thorny personality was compounded by her actions. She refused to give concessions to the people of London, and she refused the noble action of allowing Stephen's son Eustace 
to retain his land. But with Stephen imprisoned, who would rise to topple the Empress? It would be Matilda of Boulogne, Stephen's wife and Queen of England. Matilda of Boulogne with her army and eager Londoners chased the Empress out of the city. At Winchester, further disaster struck for the Empress. Not only was she defeated, but her most loyal ally and tactician, Robert of Gloucester, was captured by the royal army, led by the Queen, as the Empress scrambled back to the safety of her dwindling loyalists. She was never crowned Queen. Instead, she was given the inferior title, Lady of the English. In November 1141, Robert of Gloucester was exchanged and returned to the Empress Matilda, but with a heavy price, and the most valuable prisoner of all being returned, King Stephen. In celebration and affirmation of their sovereignty, King Stephen and Queen Matilda held a fresh coronation at Christmas 1141. The Civil War would resume, with Stephen based in Winchester and the Empress at Devizes, both claiming sovereignty over England. By this period, both leaders were somewhat discredited by their inability to depose the other, with no army powerful enough for a decisive victory. It was a war of harrying towns and besieging castles. While the Empress had had her golden opportunity with the imprisonment of the King, 1142 was the year for Stephen to gain the upper hand. Knowing the Empress was present, he took the opportunity to besiege Oxford Castle with success. He had the Empress trapped. Not to repeat his chivalry at Arundel, his plan was simple. With Oxford Castle believed to be impregnable, the royal forces were happy to block provisions and starve the occupants into submission. The Empress must have wondered how things had gone so wrong. In April 1141, she had had the king imprisoned and powerful allies by her side. By the autumn of the following year, King Stephen was released, allies had been lost, and she was surrounded by her enemies. With her husband engaged in Normandy, he provided little aid for his wife. All seemed lost. However, there would be yet more twists and turns to come. Desperately, she decided to try and escape undetected. It was near Christmas, and England was covered in heavy snow. This could play to her advantage. She was lowered from the tower on ropes. Wrapped in a pure white cloak, she stepped quietly onto the white blanket of snow. The royal guards, who were expecting a force from Robert of Gloucester, were distracted. With the utmost stealth, she sneaked past the guards of the royal camp, deceiving besiegers, dazzled by the reflection of the snow. Described by William of Malmesbury as a manifest miracle of God, the Empress walked six miles in the snow, crossing the frozen Thames to Wallingford. The timing proved consequential, as the siege was successful a short time later, with their surrender. However, with no Empress to claim. With the schism of politics, and the inability of either faction to control England, came the most harrowing legacy of the anarchy. The capitulation of the law and order 
Henry I had so carefully cultivated. Such lack of sovereignty even led to local coinage being minted in the Scottish ruled north and the heartland of Empress Matilda. With the desperate need of Stephen and the Empress for baronial support to shift the power, the barons had leverage and were free of accountability as they terrorised local populations for supplies and garrisons, and they ravaged the estates of neighbours. It released the worst tendencies of feudalism. Yet, for peasants, barons were not the only enemy. England was flooded with ruthless, bloodthirsty, trained foreign mercenaries who knew only war. Without law and order, they were free to plunder. Landowners hired security and built castles to protect themselves, but also to suppress their people. Local tyrants massacred, tortured and plundered villages as chaos reigned. In the words of Henry of Huntingdon, cries of distress, horror and woe rose in every quarter. Fire, slaughter and rape spread throughout the land. He was every man for himself. Robert Fitzhubert was one of those mercenaries who flocked to England. He said, In Normandy I burned to death forty monks in a church, and I am going to do the same thing in England. His trademark was hanging up his victims soaked in honey for the bees to feast upon. Finally, in the words of an Anglo-Saxon chronicler, it was as if God and his saints were asleep. As war waged on, with little gains for either side, in 1147, Robert of Gloucester died. Empress Matilda, the following year, nine years after arriving in England, left for good. Geoffrey's final conquest of Normandy in 1144 meant there she could retire. It may seem like Empress Matilda lost. However, she had largely completed her task, for her son Henry Plantagenet was coming of age. Henry, soon to be the successor as the Duke of Normandy, set his sights on England. Stephen, a king approaching sixty, had a new enemy, a teenager. In 1147, Age just 14, Henry led a group of fierce mercenaries to England. It was a disaster. They ran out of money and were stranded. Henry was in a precarious situation of not being able to pay his mercenaries. The problem was solved by the most unlikely person. In the words of John Gillingham, With the impudence of youth, he applied against whom he was fighting, and with characteristic generosity, Stephen sent Henry enough money to pay his mercenaries and go home. Not to be killed with kindness, Henry would try again, but failed when he invaded from the north. Henry became the new Duke of Normandy, 
when his father Geoffrey died. In 1153, Henry would try to invade England for a third time. He arrived with 3,000 infantrymen and 140 knights. According to the Chronicle, Gustav Stefani, they attacked the already devastated town of Malmesbury, where they scaled the walls, butchered the incumbents, and desecrated the church's altar. Stephen arrived. The king, tired of siege warfare, wanted a pitched battle to finish once and for all the dreadful civil war. As the armies faced off, the floodgates of heaven opened and such bitter cold gusts of wind and pouring rain were driven into their faces that God himself seemed to be fighting for the Duke. So wet and cold, the shivering knights could barely grasp their lances, but there would be no fighting. Veterans of 15 years of war, Stephen's men refused to engage, so Stephen retreated. Henry realised the mistakes of his mother and of Stephen. Foreign mercenaries, like the ones he'd hired, were despised by the local people for the torment and horror that they had caused. Any leader of those ruthless men would never be adorned as king. He dismissed 500 of them. They set sail for Europe. The English would be quick to thank a divine being when all of them perished at sea in a storm. Henry's new tact would be of his grandfather's, Henry I, to avoid conflict wherever possible and to try diplomacy. He spent a year persuading barons, projecting himself as a credible king, while sending peaceful tones to King Stephen. Even Stephen's most loyal barons began to warm to the young Plantagenet. Still, conflict could not be avoided forever. Another pitched battle at Wallingford was organised. Again, Stephen's men refused to fight. Instead, negotiations began. The idea of Henry succeeding the king became the likely outcome. There was one big problem, however. Stephen had a ruthless, violent, ambitious son. When Eustace found out the potential plan to disinherit him, he went on a nefarious rampage of pillaging to release his fury. He then died of eating rotten food, or perhaps from sheer grief. With the support of Louis of France, Eustace would have been a significant thorn in the side of Henry. The family's luck was changing. Transition was suddenly made easy. Stephen, beset with grief after losing his wife, Matilda of Boulogne, and his son Eustace in the same year, was prepared to bend significantly. Stephen would effectively adopt Henry as his son in order for him to succeed him as king. An extravagant ceremony at Winchester was followed by a bizarre propaganda tour of the country to demonstrate peace and unity, but also to introduce their new king. Stephen joined Henry enthusiastically. Henry of Newburgh said, Encircling the bounds of England, with regal pomp, and showing himself off as if he were the new king. The people, ravaged by war, lapped it up. The anarchy was over. Just a year later, Stephen was dead. He died suddenly, with a stabbing pain in his gut. In contrast to the treatment of England and its people during his reign, his body was treated fairly, breaking the tradition of poorly handled corpses 
of Norman Kings. He was buried in Faversham Abbey in Kent. Yet in a familiar story, his tomb was later destroyed during the Reformation. And so passed Stephen, the last Norman King. It is a reign remembered for just one thing, the anarchy. As contemporaries, exercise no hesitation in their condemnation. I know not how to, nor am I able to tell of, all the atrocities, nor all the cruelties, which they wrought upon the unhappy people of this country. And so it lasted for 19 long years, while Stephen was king, till the land was all undone and darkened with such deeds. However, as much as a country was plunged into anarchy, the deal which would confirm his successor allowed the country to heal, and for the first time in a century, England would have an undisputed king. So began a new dawn of Plantagenets. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Twitter at Kings Queens Pod and on Facebook, the Kings and Queens Podcast. Join us next week for your first Plantagenet, Henry II. See you next week.